Microservices, something a lot of people remind you that you don't actually need. Few people have actually implemented it. Fewer people understand the problems it tries to solve. And even fewer number of people know the history of how this architectural pattern came about. The summer is really awful in Europe. Let's get started. A lot of the applications that we develop start as a monolith because this is the natural way to structure our code. A monolith does not necessarily mean that we don't split the code into different functions, modules, components, or classes. It just means that all of these are combined together into a single code base, single repository where all of the code is contained and where all of the business logic resides. When we want to use a monolithic application, we generally run it or deploy it as a single application. It could connect to other third-party applications, but that's the keyword here, third-party. If there's functionality that you need to implement, you integrate it in that same code base. Monolithic applications can take you very, very far, but there is a point where these applications will start causing more problems than offering solutions. Monolithic applications can scale by something called vertical scaling, where we can add more resources to the servers hosting our application. We can add more CPU, more RAM, more disk space. And with the cloud today, this is something really easy for us to do with a click of a button. Monolithic applications can serve hundreds of millions of users. Depending on how they are architected and depending on how well the code is designed, we can serve hundreds of thousands of requests per second with great performance. There are a lot of successful monolithic SaaS products out there. GitHub, for example, is one of them. It's a single gigantic Ruby application that is serving hundreds of millions of developers every single day. However, as teams grow, as more engineers are added and contributing to the code base, we start hitting some of the pain points of monoliths. Because this entire code base is managed in, for example, a single Git repository, Git doesn't really do well with gigantic code bases with a commit history spanning multiple decades, for example, with thousands of engineers contributing code on a daily basis. Some of the simpler operations will start becoming a pain point, for example, doing a Git pull or Git fetch. And yes, there are obviously some solutions for it, like using shallow clones or sparse checkouts. But still, this is not the full story and some operations will still require us to do a full-blown checkout and that could take minutes on really big repositories. Now, another problem with monoliths is that there are different teams who might be contributing code around the same time and they might be touching the same files, for example, and that could lead to a lot of chaos when it comes to merging pull requests or whenever you're trying to do multiple deployments a day. Now, obviously, there are certain solutions for these. We can structure the code differently so that the areas of ownerships of certain teams will not touch the areas of ownerships of other teams. However, this is not a foolproof solution and there are limitations for this. Now on the infrastructure side, monoliths can become difficult to scale horizontally. We cannot create more of the same because it's expensive to run them on the one hand. Also to be able to handle horizontal scaling, the application needs to be re-architected so that we can put a load balancer in front of our application and start splitting the traffic to different instances. A big part of why monoliths do not scale is the database. This is going to be the biggest pain point for a lot of monolithic applications. And this is the first bottleneck you're going to observe. The code will run just fine, but database transactions and database queries are going to be some of your worst bottlenecks. Insert service oriented architecture. This came way before microservices, and it was a way to split this monolith into independent services, but they can coordinate between each other to serve a common purpose. What that means is whenever we get a request, for example, and that HTTP request that's coming in from the client, it needs to do a certain amount of transactions. These transactions can be split into three separate requests, for example, that can go to three separate services. And these services need to find a way to orchestrate together so that they can come up with the outcome or the result that needs to be sent back to the client via the HTTP response. Now, obviously this worked well, but what happened is with service-oriented architecture, we just split the monolith into smaller monoliths. We didn't really solve the entire problem. We just simply distributed that problem to smaller chunks. It's not that big of a problem anymore, depending on how busy and active that particular service is. Insert microservices. There's really no clear consensus on the origin of the term microservices. The dream of loosely coupled software had many thought leaders in our industry converge towards the same architectural pattern roughly around the same period of time. In 2005, 
Peter Rogers introduced the term micro web services during a presentation at the Web Services Edge conference. At that point in time, SOAP or SOAP, whichever way you want to call it, which refers to simple object access protocol and service oriented architectures were quite the hype at that period of time. Everybody wanted to implement them and many people were coming up with use cases to demonstrate the efficacy of service oriented architectures. And Peter argued that software could also be split further from large monolithic sort of services into smaller microservices where they could behave as smaller modules of a large code base and they could act independently of each other. Hence the term micro. These microservices could be technology stack agnostic, meaning you could pretty much use any programming language you desire as long as you define very clear and strict interfaces and a communication protocol for these microservices to be able to communicate and integrate together. In 2007, Yuval Lovi was experimenting for how to make each class in code bases an independent service. And he tried to implement this using the Windows Communication Foundation, WCF. Personally, I'm not really sure how successful it is and whether I really want to make my code base structured in that way, but we're not judging. Fast forwarding to 2011, many architects have already started exploring microservices in production and they were running multiple workshops trying to share their learnings and share the best practices. In 2012, Adrian Cockroft, who was the former director of cloud systems at Netflix, described this approach as fine-grained SOA or fine-grained service-oriented architecture. Obviously, just like anything that is hyped in the following years, many companies started jumping on the bandwagon of microservices and many industry thought leaders started talking about best practices and even wrote books, seminars, videos, courses, you name it, about microservices. <sighs> Now, what is good about microservices and what is bad? The first good thing about microservices is that the teams who own a particular microservice will have way more autonomy in publishing their changes. They can even have a regular cadence of deployments and each microservice can have its own independent lifecycle. If for whatever reason you need to inform others before you release your microservice or wait on others before you can release your microservice, then you're doing microservices wrong. We're gonna talk about that in the bad points. Scaling microservices obviously is easier because the business logic is very much contained in the microservice itself. There's not much going on. The microservices have to be sort of impotent, meaning whatever input we provide, we always expect the same exact output, no matter how many times we provide that same request. Creating more of the same of these microservices is obviously way easier than doing it with monolith. Microservices can have very clear domain boundaries. They can be designed to be good at one thing and do it really, really well, as opposed to monoliths, which have to cover a much bigger domain area. Now let's talk about the bad. And some of these items are not intrinsically bad with the architecture itself. They are coming from the misimplementation of microservices and or lack of understanding of what microservices are supposed to be. Or one of the biggest factors is an organization that is not necessarily mature trying to implement microservices at the wrong time and with the wrong technical talent. Let's dive into this. The first problem is the trap of premature optimization. Remember at the beginning of the video, I told you that monoliths can scale to hundreds of thousands of requests, depending on what you're really trying to do with these requests. The trap of premature optimizations happens when you have non-informed stakeholders who are pushing for their engineers to handle scale way before they even get to that scaling point. They are sort of preemptively trying to implement these architectures that they think could handle scale, just because they feel that this is the right thing to do and that trying to rewrite the application down the line or refactoring it or maybe even re-architecting it is a big cost that they don't want to bear at that advanced point in time. So they try to deal with that problem way before it becomes a problem. And in my opinion, this is totally wrong. This is premature optimization that is not necessary at all. Some problems have to be tackled when they become problems. You never really know if that product of yours is going to reach the scales that you think in your imagination are going to reach. It's great to be ambitious, but dealing with microservices earlier than you should be is going to make it even costlier to run this infrastructure from now. The second problem with microservices is that a lot of people think they're going to fix a broken engineering culture when the engineering organization or team, depending on the scale, do not know how to function together and they do not know how to even work sometimes asynchronously because of internal forces or because of external forces that are thrown onto them 
them. Irrespective of that, the engineering organization is not as efficient as it should be. Organizational problems are rarely solved with technical solutions, and they require a deeper understanding from both the stakeholders, the engineering leaders, and from the engineers themselves for what are some of their main pain points, and they need to figure out together how to deal with them jointly. The solution will never come from just one area of focus. Another thing that I've seen in the field is when teams are not ready or do not understand the overhead that comes with implementing microservices. When you have a monolith, you have to worry about the deployment and the release and the integration of one application. When you have microservices, you are multiplying this by the number of microservices that you have, which means that the overhead of managing the integration, deployment, and delivery could explode exponentially. Also, a bad implementation of microservices is even way more costly than redesigning or re-architecting a monolith down the line whenever you need it. You will know that you are doing a bad implementation of microservices whenever you have split the code, but still you are using a monolithic database. And what I mean by that is your tables are still tightly coupled. You did not really denormalize them, irrespective of whether you're still using the same database cluster or not. Another example is when you have an over-reliance on shared libraries, or even if you have shared libraries that are common across the, your different microservices because you want to avoid repeating your code. Another issue that could arise is a bad implementation of APIs and interfaces where they are not consistent, you don't have a proper release cycle, you're not doing versioning appropriately, and you don't have a way to update all of the clients that are consuming your APIs. I could really go on forever with this. Another issue is lack of DevOps maturity within the organization. This is very critical. Building, deploying, and delivering Delivering microservices requires a lot of automation. If you don't have automation in place, believe me, you're gonna fail miserably. Lack of observability. In a monolith, you could be spitting out logs and you might be able to get away with it. But with microservices, the state of your application is now distributed across so many different microservices. For you to be able to observe the state of your system, you need to compile information from so many different sources and try to aggregate all of that data so that you can understand what's really happening in your distributed system. This is not something easy to do, and this requires a lot of investment in tooling, time, and effort, and everything related to proper observability. Distributed transactions with microservices are a nightmare. I've seen a lot of people try to do transactions that are distributed. It's always, always, always a problem. Transactions in certain systems are inevitable. Sometimes you need to be able to roll back changes that you've made because the transaction did not go through. Try to do that when you are splitting the logic across four or five different microservices services. Good luck. For developers, having an environment running microservices end-to-end, -end, that means that someone on their own machine, computer, or using, I don't know, code spaces from GitHub, it's going to be very difficult for them to set up a development environment where they can have all of the different microservices running together so that they can maybe test their changes across the system or maybe even introducing new features. If you don't have the capacity to do that from the get-go, microservices is going to be a big fail. Nobody can really tell you how big or small your microservices service needs to be. A lot of people have these loose definitions of the size of your microservice. They talk about domain boundaries, but they leave the actual decision for you. And the wrong sizing of microservices, in my opinion, can lead to a lot of catastrophic results, or at the very least, unintended consequences. And by then, the refactoring of these microservices and aggregating or combining them together is even way more costly than managing with the problems of the monolith. And the last thing I wanna talk about, because trust me, there are still so many more problems that could come from microservices, but the very last one is dealing with authorization. Dealing with authentication is easy. You can get one request from the client, you ship it to the authentication service, it can confirm whether this client is authenticated or not, and based on that, you can move forward to the other services. However, dealing with authorization problems, specifically permissions, roles, and what the user is allowed or not allowed to do on your platform, platform is an entirely different beast and implementing authorization using microservices is a very tricky problem. As a final conclusion, be very careful when you want to implement microservices. Do not rush and implement microservices because you preemptively think it's going to solve the problems of future scale. Address these problems when they actually become problems. Your energy is better spent in building a proper engineering culture within your organization. It is better spent in maturing more in your DevOps practices. It is better spent in implementing appropriate continuous integration and continuous deployment if 
the product that you are building facilitates that. Your energy is also better spent in building better observability, building better infrastructure, and in trying to get everybody to level up. If you invest in these areas, these will allow you to scale way more what microservices will allow you to do, especially if you do it prematurely. Now, obviously for educational purposes, if you want to learn about microservices, there are plenty of references. They are in the description of this video. There are plenty of other opinions about why it works, why it doesn't work, but nothing will give you the real perspective until you implement it yourself or be fortunate enough to be involved in a project that implemented microservices. That's where the real learning is really going to happen. Good luck.